Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, We also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Jürgen Steinmetz. Jürgen is the chairman of World uh, World Tourism Network, CEO of Travel News Group, publisher of eTurbo News and Hawaii News Online. Welcome to the podcast. Well, I'm I'm so delighted to be invited and speak to you today. Thank you so much. Aloha. 
for joining me. Let's start with, um, it'd be great for you to tell us a little bit about the different hats you wear and give us a bit of information about the organizations and the publications you lead, Jürgen. Well, um, there is a lot to it. Actually, um, eTurbo News is my main publication. So many uh, people know me for many years because we started in 1999 with a publication called eTurbo News. And actually it started in Indonesia. Um, I've been involved in travel and tourism since the late 70s, so you can see how old I am. <laughs> and I'm um, originally from Germany, moved to the United States in 1984. And uh, I was involved in various aspects in the travel and tourism industry. Last in the 90s, um, represented Indonesia as a tourism office in the United States and Canada. And as you may remember, the end of the 90s, there was a lot of political turmoil in Indonesia, but um, ended up with travel warnings by the United States, exactly at the time when we were supposed to uh, promote that country in the US. This was like 1999, 2000. So uh, one of the uh, tools we had when internet just became more popular and many people had email addresses and uh, many more wanted to get websites, uh, we thought, okay, instead of spending money uh, in advertising our message for Indonesia, why don't we try to do an email list? And we run into something what was called Yahoo Group and put a Yahoo Group together. And um, with the help of our friends in Indonesia and other sources, we grew this group to about uh, 25,000 travel agents in the US. And our message was really a message about um, what people should watch out for and how they should interpret the U.S. travel warnings, the geographics of the countries, and so forth. Now, how we got our impossible name to market and branding for br marketing and branding eTurbo News was a company that sponsored us. Uh, there was a company out there in Singapore. It was called eTurbo Hotels. And what they did is bought all the domain names, specifically in Indonesia, like Hilton.id, like Indonesia.id, or Star Wars, Star Wars wasn't around, or maybe Marriott.id, and offered them a free website design in return for getting commission on online sales. So it was kind of the first Expedia or hotel or Agoda type booking site in the world, and they became our sponsor. So we called it eTurbo News, and we kept the name even after they went out of business or were bought by a larger company. And um, after we stopped our program with Indonesia, what was in 2001, um, we kind of became independent and grew our email database uh, to um, a global audience um, in um, partnering with organizations like ITB. It's a large trade show in Berlin and Germany and many others. And over the years, I think uh, we're kind of the pioneers in online news distribution for the travel and tourism industry. And as you grow in this business, of course, you're looking for other sources and other revenue um, streams and opportunities. So a few of them come up were how we expanded. Um, one, we started a number of other blogs like meetings.travel, aviation, um, uh, LGBT, and, and, and all kinds of different um, segments mostly related to the uh, travel and tourism industry and started our own blogs within this and that kept on growing so i don't want to bore you with the entire story there's a lot more and i can tell you maybe later where we are today uh, depending you know what you wanted me to yeah. explain yeah or wonderful understanding and to your story that's what i really want to do let's start with going all the way down okay in that I'm, I'm so sorry johnny you kind of disappeared so i only heard like every other word themes I'm I'm so sorry, Johnny. I really couldn't. I cannot understand you. There is, um, 
I don't know if you hear me, but I couldn't understand what you were saying. I only heard like clips and pieces of words. Speak to you into the person you are today. Hello, can you still hear me? Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Must have had a connection issue. Can you hear me now? Okay, now I can, now I can hear you better. And I'm, I'm really sorry. I really did not understand hardly anything you were asking. So sorry. That's right. No, no. We'll leave a big pause and I'll get my team to cut that bit out because our internet over right. here, Jürgen, isn't great in Australia. And I think it must have just dropped out a bit. So not, not a pause problem. for 10 seconds and then I'll jump back in. Sure. Again, let's start with your childhood. I'd love to know for you, what were some of those moments from your childhood and growing up that really shaped you into the person uh, you are today? Well, see, I've been in the travel and tourism business all my life, and that kind of started with the childhood. And I think my um, very first experience when I started really to look, wow, traveling is great. When I was invited by a friend to fly on a little Cessna over my hometown, Düsseldorf, and uh, this kind of uh, really shaped me. I must have been like 12, 13 years old uh, at the time. And um, after this, I was sold. And I thought travel and tourism, that's really something I like to get into. Um, and I did. Um, I organized for our local swimming club. I was big in swimming at the time. Uh, tours we had, um, even when I was like 17 or 18 years old, we took our uh, fellow uh, sports um, teammates and and, and stayed in youth hostels and organized it. And that kept on going. And probably the highlight of all of this was our um, participation, not as athletes, but as spectators at the Olympic Games in 1976 in Montreal, uh, where we then met really people from all over the world, and um, including probably most prominently a group from a little town or later in Kansas in the United States, we befriended and then started a, a family or like a, an exchange program where um, our group of young people stayed with families in Kansas one year. And then the next year, people from there came over to Germany where I lived at the time. And that also was one of the reasons I ended up actually moving to the US. And I first lived in Kansas uh, before I made my way um, in back uh, in the late 80s to Hawaii. Um, and um, ever since I was involved in all kinds of uh, businesses related to travel and tourism, I worked for a large travel agency. I worked on a cruise ship. And, um, and it was something I've, I was always fascinated with. I know on the weekend, um, I, I traveled uh, to Egypt for a day and did all these crazy things, uh, especially when you grow up in the, in the 70s. Um, many people did not do it at the time, you know, it, it was a little bit different, but I can that kind of shaped me when it comes to being part of this uh, fascinating industry in the world. And I love to, I, I love to meet people from all over the place. And I know, um, in, in the, uh, when I lived in Germany in the late seventies or very early eighties, I, um, was inv invited by a friend, um, who, I, I never really met, but uh, from uh, Australia, and we went to the Whitsunday Islands on a sailing trip, and this was absolutely fantastic. I, one of my supplier at the time was Singapore Airlines, and uh, they provided a free first-class ticket to travel from Frankfurt to uh, Sydney, and I went uh, down via Brisbane to, I think it called Early Beach, and, um, and we had a wonderful time, two weeks on the sailing boat, uh, in Australia. So that, that, that was definitely an experience I never forget. Yeah, yeah. You you listed uh, some locations. I'm up in Queensland in Brisbane in Australia. So some of the places you've mentioned aren't too far away from where we are here. And uh, they're very popular and, uh, and for good reason locations. And some of the places you mentioned, people don't necessarily know. They might know the Gold Coast, but uh, highly <laughs> recommend that people um, check yeah. out Hamilton Island, and then um, and then of course, oh yeah, like I remember said, all of those. Sundays. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. That's, so good. That's what, yeah, so, so travel and tourism was always uh, something and, um, uh, and I got involved with. I had my first company. Um, I started back in the uh, late uh, 70s, it was, uh, my own t- company. I really hardly ever worked for anyone because I've always had my own businesses and I loved it. And I had my friends working for me and uh, some of my relatives working for me. And I remember like in the early 80s, I made good money. I was driving a Mercedes. And I remember the time when I was too scared to to park the Mercedes at my parents' house. Uh, not to be questioned, where do you have all this money coming from? Uh, so I parked it always a few blocks away and took my old Volkswagen and drove to the house. So I, I, it is a lot of fun <laughs> memories, I have to say. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, as you've, I, I guess, as Maria Jürgen, what, uh, I should say, who the mentors for you? Who are some of the people along the way who have had the greatest positive influence on your leadership? Well, there's not just one pe- uh, one person. It depends really um, on the time and um, what um, happened at one specific uh, time. There, there are many of them. One of my mentors was um, a person by the name of Hubertus Rank, who was actually my boss at the first travel agency. The only job I actually had working for Hapag Cloud Travel before I started my own business. And he kind of uh, guided me in another mentor was a former school teacher I'm still in touch with. He's now 85 or 88 years old in Germany, um, who always had a really uh, different view of the world. And I was fascinated by uh, having discussions in school with him. And then later on, as you uh, grow into the business, there are many others that come along. I I remember the um, gentleman in Indonesia by the name of Faisal Hashim. He is still there. He owns the Alam Kulkul Group. He taught me a lot in the business, and that's how we actually got our representation for Indonesia. Or uh, Dr. Talib Rifai, who was the Secretary General for the UNWTO, a wonderful man. He's in Jordan, and we still talk very often. He's also involved in our World Tourism Network. These are all people um, you meet. Uh, Jeffrey Lipman, for example, still a good friend in Brussels, uh, into he was the uh, one of the f- was the first CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council and um, uh, Deputy Secretary General for the UNWTO. Now he's in environmental and saving and climate change and all these things. And, and there's so many people out there. The travel business is a wonderful business, really, to meet people and meet leaders and meet people that are creative and have ideas and um, probably way too many to mention, but there are a lot of mentors out there, I think. Yeah, yeah. wonderful. You mentioned there. Um, what about aha moments for you? Your career, can you think of any aha moments off the top of your head that, you know, a, a, a lesson that you learned in leadership or something that you made a mistake with you um, or a, a win that you had that was against the odds or... or Gabe, is there anything that comes into your mind as a, an aha moment for you? Oh, there, there are probably a lot of aha moments, and, and I've had my up and downs in my business, especially when you're in, in your own business and you, you start something and you're all excited. I know when I moved to Hawaii, uh, my, my company was one of the first uh, companies that welcomed uh, South Korean visitors to the to Hawaii and to the United States at that time almost all flights from Asia to the US had to land in Hawaii uh, so we had a sizable operation but um, I, I didn't know how tough it is really to compete um, with um, in this business especially when other when others think this is money and then all the big guys like JTB and everyone else came into this so I couldn't hold the business we just simply couldn't compete and these are things you learn also when you rely on on certain facts to run your business and an experience I had with was when I got started with Indonesia um, we bought 40 50 seats on every Garuda Airlines flight from Los Angeles, Honolulu to Bali and had a wonderful program or made good money. And then all of a sudden Garuda stopped flying. So what are you going to do? You never really expect this. So I think you always have to be 
have a plan B and in, in uh, ready to go. And, um, and many times I didn't, not many times, but sometimes I didn't have this plan B. And, and then you, you look back, I said, well, I should have done this differently and we should have been prepared for something else. And look at the recent situation uh, for many in our business with COVID, um, how, many comp how many people in the travel and tourism industry had to change industry or out of business or lost their life savings. These are all situations you really cannot predict. Could there be a plan B? Yes, in some parts of the world, like um, when there is government support, there could be. But what about in other parts of the world, like our many friends in many of the African companies? How can they dig themselves out of a situation? So there, there are always unpredictable uh, circumstances. And um, I, I think it's important, you cannot cover everything, but that you kind of uh, really try to plan for the unknown. Uh, and that's something I always had a little bit of a problem with, to be honest. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I think the industry you're in is very, um, uh, can, be, be, can be volatile, can be challenging, definitely. So uh, you being someone who's not necessarily, um, you know, you've had to learn how to do that, how to come in and, and how to plan B. What advice would you give to leaders who are listening who are in other sectors been thrown by COVID and been disrupted by COVID? What have you learned about how to manage this? Well, it's, 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 of course, everyone is talking about resilience and how resilient the tourism industry is. And it is, but is resilience really everywhere? Can you sustain resilience? And uh, to give advice, I think there are too many circumstances. Um, um, in this. And I think a lot of um, those that have been very active in travel and tourism change to other professions. And so you, you need to have a second leg where you can stand on. Um, and uh, when something like COVID like happens, of course, maybe then you have to use this other leg um, to uh, continue. Now, it's really hard to give advice because especially when it comes to COVID, we're not really through this yet. I mean, we're, we're still learning. We don't know what's happening tomorrow. You're looking at the situation in North Korea right now. It's frightening. And um, it, you're looking at uh, COVID numbers in, in Europe and even here in the United States. They're not even disclosed anymore. And, and there's still in the U.S. two to 300 people dying every day or even more. And we kind of overlook this. It's like the passenger count of a white body aircraft. And uh, we kind of um, see it as a normal. And then we're hearing about uh, the situation about uh, anything about inflation. Uh, we're hearing about a war in, the U in Ukraine and, and Russia. So this is a very fragile world right now. And we don't know how the future will look like and, and how to prepare and, and and, and what to do to protect yourself. I think every case is different, but of course, everyone should be aware um, these are not stable and uh, solid times right now. And, and we, we got to realize this and we got to do what we need to do uh, to protect ourselves, protect our families and, and see where uh, we uh, could go if things don't work out exactly the way you initially planned things. Yeah, I think that's that's good advice. And I like what you said that, well, it's t it's hard to give advice as an answer because uh, it really does depend. It's one of those questions about how you handle disruption that is um, really depend, I guess it's case by case, um, potentially what you're saying. So I I guess for, for you as someone in travel, and you've been in travel for so long, you've been through the big changes where do you see travel going as an industry for leaders who are listening and aren't in your sector and industry where do you see travel heading in the next five ten years and beyond well we're seeing some interesting shifting right now in the world of travel and um if you look at the situation in saudi arabia saudi arabia came out of nothing. Besides religious travel and Hajj, people never really thought about looking at Saudi Arabia. 
Now what's happening now, this country during the crisis was able to invest billions and billions and billions of dollars, not only into their own infrastructure, but also into the travel industry in other countries. So they became a global leader, a global influencer, and a global owner um, of a lot what was our travel and tourism industry. So all the big organization, UNWTO, the World Travel and Tourism Council, uh, the Global Resilient and Crisis Center, now have headquarters or main representatives in Saudi Arabia and all sponsored by this one country. Is this a good thing? I mean, if uh, then you, I mean, you to, to spin it even more, um, if you look at, at people that were considered top leaders in the travel and tourism industry, many of them you find now in Saudi Arabia, Gloria Guevara, who was the CEO of the World Travel and Tourism Council um, after she was tourism minister in Mexico uh, and considered the most powerful uh, woman in travel and tourism, um, is now the top advisor to the minister of tourism in Saudi Arabia. Is this a good thing? Maybe. Is this a frightening thing? Perhaps. Um, and what about human rights in Saudi Arabia? Are they working on it? Is this still a concern? No one talks about it. Um, and um, that's where the money is. So I think a lot of um, tourism will be influenced in this part of the world, whether it's Saudi Arabia, the UAE, uh, whether it's airline hubs in, in Dubai, in, in, um, uh, in, in Abu Dhabi or in Turkey with Turkish Airlines. Um, these are all becoming new centers in travel and tourism. The traditional destinations, um, of course, are will be continuing, um, and and depending on uh, local political and health situations. Uh, Europe right now is um, has a number of question marks on the horizon because of the war in Ukraine. So I'm going to I see we're going to see some shifting. Africa is uh, quite active, um, has an excellent product when it comes to tourism, doesn't necessarily have the infrastructure in place, but then there are guys out there trying to help them and they're helping them because of political influences. And these are countries like Russia, China, Saudi Arabia. Uh, so with, I think what we will be seeing in travel and tourism is a shift in leadership and those that influence um, how the industry is structured and, and functioning. And uh, I think we're just at the beginning of it now. Yeah, that's really interesting. Uh, Arabia, who are some of the other big players that you see right uh, you know, that we should be paying attention to in the next decade in travel? Well, many of them are in the same area. Uh, let's the United Arab Emirates, specifically Dubai, Abu Dhabi. Uh, Qatar is a small, smaller player. I think in Africa, um, we will we should uh, pay attention to Rwanda, uh, Tanzania. Uh, they're really in in uh, coming along. In in Europe, of course, the traditional destinations like uh, Italy and uh, Spain, I think uh, they're going to recover when it comes to travel and tourism. And um, when it comes to a lot of the travel and tourism because of COVID for the last two, three years, what was left at least, has been on a domestic or regional front. Um, so in the United States, for example, my own destination, I live in Hawaii, we had been booming already when it comes to tourism for many months or even more than a year uh, because people were scared or couldn't because of regulations travel outside the country, this, in this case, the United States. So where are they going? They're going to Hawaii. Um, so there had been some definite shifting in the type of visitors we had before we had visitors um, mainly from, uh, um, besides our domestic visitors, mainly from Japan, Korea, also Australia, China. They're just slowly now coming back, but uh, some of them are not coming back at all. So there's some shifting. So the entire industry is, is, uh, is adjusting right now. And then of course you have a worldwide crisis of um, not available staff because of COVID. A lot of the hotel workers, people who did uh, who work in restaurants and so forth found other jobs so now 
in not only here in Hawaii, um, but in many other destinations in the world, uh, hotels cannot really provide daily room service anymore. We just uh, did a story yesterday on the situation at airports in um, Frankfurt. When you fly out of Frankfurt right now, um, almost un unless you go on a 14 hour flight, there's no meal service because they don't have staff in the kitchen at the service companies to provide meals to the airlines, to their clients. A similar situation is going on in Munich. They have board members now from the airport shifting in and doing kitchen duty. So there, is, um, there are meals on some of these flights. So we're all of a sudden getting into problems we never thought we would be getting it before. Yeah, so interesting. I mean, a lot of these things people, our listeners may not have heard, may not have thought of before, not in that sector. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Let's jump into Leadership Express. So the first one, you. what is a book that you've gifted a lot to other people? A lot to other people. Well, I'm uh, uh, maybe I'm a little bit biased, but I, I've read almost all the books from Dr. Peter Talo. And I also, just to disclose, I, I work, we work with Peter on the safety security part. So uh, he has written some fascinating books about tourism, safety, security, uh, sports travel, and, and many other subjects. And um, I always read it when I get it. I'm not someone who reads a lot of books. Maybe it's a time thing. I, I much rather just... Um, go to the internet and, and, and read what I wanted to read or, or, or watch a documentary and so forth. Um, but when it comes to the few books I've seen, um, almost I think exclusively in the last few years were written by Peter. And um, they, he has some subjects that are really important and he goes with the time. And um, it all deals kind of in the broader sense with the safety security part of our industry. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, safety, one of those areas where safety has been, um, uh, it's been an, <laughs> an interesting part of, obviously so incredibly important to people. Uh, uh, this is just something that popped into my head as you talked about that, Jürgen. There are other industries that are being hit by because of cyber security. So it's much less, less they're, they're industries that have never been um, like an industry like travel might, and yet now sudden really scratching their head over risk, big, you know, existential threats where and data and, and organizations can really go under weeks or months. Um, As someone who's been in an industry that's had to deal with safety for, uh, you know, so long and, and working out how to not only create, say, communicate that to people, what, what have you learned? What would you, you say, say to other leaders in about how to navigate risk mitigation and safety? What do you learn from Well, if you, if you look at the, the cyber crime, of course, that's something we didn't know many years ago, and it becomes an issue probably not only in travel and tourism everywhere. Then you have political cyber crime, uh, specifically now with the current uh, situation in Europe, we have to be very much aware of. And uh, I can tell you my, my, my own little company, we have been attacked, specifically attacked in uh, one time, specific keywords were just eliminated from Google through cyber attacks. We only noticed uh, weeks after it happened. Um, so no one is really immune. I mean, of course, besides our industry, um, aviation being crippled uh, that uh, with, um, with uh, attacks, I mean, if there's no, um, if the computer system is not working, you cannot check in for flights, you cannot operate uh, flight safe, uh, safe uh, uh, safety. And literally we're all relying on, on our cyber industry to protect us, but it also can harm us. And um, that is something I think we really need to be aware and prepared for, and of course, uh, that reflects every in industry there is and everyone. I mean, if um, if there was a cyber war, uh, I, I read this article the other day, how easy it is to turn off the el electricity literally worldwide. And it's um, we're living in a completely different world. And 
our grand grandmothers and fathers lived a hundred years ago, and um, there are uh, so many new uh, ways of how we have to protect ourselves um, in order to maneuver through our high tech environment. I think. Isn't it? To, and I think that's a big challenge for leaders is, is how to navigate that. Uh, so thank you for answering that question. Uh, next question. What is a great piece of advice you've received, Jürgen? Someone gave you a piece of advice at some point, Chip, and it's really turned out to be very true and helpful. Uh, well, for, for me, helpful is I'm, I'm a person who doesn't want to give up. I don't want to say, I don't want to uh, give no as an answer. So I always was fighting for what I wanted to do in business and in personal life. And I stayed firm with my opinion. And um, I, I think the advice that in some cases you just have to cut your losses and move on was one of the most valuable uh, advices in, in life. I I have been given and you say, okay, it's really not the end of the world if you give up on, 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 on one thing so you can continue with the rest of the things in, in a more organized fashion. Uh, that's just me personally. I mean, there, of course, there are many, many other good advices you, <laughs> advice you, you can get from people. From, uh, there are so many people with expertise specifically and in our, our business and and you, I mean, there are so many different subjects and uh, areas. I'm I'm fascinated when it comes with human rights and and many other issues people don't want to talk about. I um, and, and it, it I don't really know how to answer it. But I mean, I think there are many, many, many situations um, uh, mm. you you go through in life where someone gives you an advice and you say, "Oh, this was really is really the case." Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Hey, last question. This has been so much fun. Um, if you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? <laughs> um, I would probably say go for it. Um, don't let anyone tell you what you can't do. You can do it. And and I, I, I really think that's always how I, I lived. I think that's why I never really worked for anyone else. I, I just went the way I want. Sometimes uh, uh, you fail in a way, but you can always get up. And, and I think it's important to be optimistic and to go through life with an optimistic uh, sense and just be a go-getter. I think go-getters are successful in life and, and they love what they're doing. Um, I could not picture myself in a job um, doing something very routine all day and and, and hate my job. I, I want to love my job because it's part of my life. And I think for a young person, that may be important to take a look at it. I said, do something you really enjoy doing in life because uh, not only eight hours yeah. a day, in many cases, you do this 16 hours a day and you, you got to have fun mm. with this. So true. Uh, well, those who've really enjoyed hearing some of your story and your advice, uh, where you and connect with you online, Jürgen? Well, there, there are many websites we have, but uh, perhaps uh, the, the easiest, if you look at our World Tourism Network, that is an organization, uh, what is quite young, we started during the COVID crisis, um, and uh, it has a lot of information, links also from many other of our um, members. Just go to WTN.travel. WTN stands for World Tourism Network dot travel instead of dot com or you can go to worldtourismnetwork.org and uh, you find a lot of the things um, I'm I have been working with and from there you can also link to eTurbo News uh, my publication and uh, many of the other initiatives I'm involved in one of the things I really enjoy is our Heroes Award um, and um, and these are awards for people who go the extra mile in uh, travel and tourism. There's never a charge for it. We don't charge marketing fees. We don't sell any certificates. And we have anything from ministers to bellboys uh, in there that uh, won awards. If you want to take a look at this, just go to heroes.travel and you'll find some amazing people who did uh, amazing things for the for our sector in the business. Yeah, wonderful. 
great, uh, great place for people to go and visit. Um, well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. What a fun episode, getting to know a bit of Jürgen's story, chatting about the future of travel. Um, don't forget White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast. Two other to continue to grow in your list. But I want to finish today by saying a massive thank you to you, Jürgen, for coming on the podcast, for sharing wonderful stories and being such a joy. Thanks so much for, for coming on. No, I had a lot of fun, and thank thank you, Johnny, for having me. And I'm going to subscribe to your podcast, hopefully. I want to hear more what other people are saying. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders And, you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this, I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and and please do that. And look for me, John O. White, or clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases, you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in Step Up or Step Out. 
And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. Uh, 95% of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.